I first heard about the Nobel Prize when I was a small child in Japan. The Nobel Prize in Literature is the most exhaustively discussed, dissected, and argued over literary prize in the world. Kazuo Ishiguro won it in 2017. That's probably, yes, the, the greatest prize that a person can win in the world. Not everyone is quite so enthusiastic about the honor. Doris Lessing won in 2007. I've won all the prizes in Europe, every bloody one, so I'm delighted to win them all. It's a sort of a whole, a whole lot, okay? For her, the prize was a fuss over nothing. Every year, the Nobel Prize in Literature attracts speculation that more closely resembles horse race political commentary. Journalists pontificate about who has the best chance of winning. Bookies even offer odds on particular authors. This year, several commentators have argued that the prize should be awarded to Salman Rushdie, who has lived under a fatwa since 1989 and who was stabbed at a literary festival in August. People want the Nobel Prize to make a political statement in this case in support of free speech. And the prize does have political implications. What does it mean, for instance, to award it to a dissident writer? Or to a highly controversial writer like Peter Handke, who won in 2019. The politics of the prize are slippery and unpredictable. Today on the show, we're talking with a fanatical Nobel watcher, TNR staff writer Alex Shepard, about what the prize means and who won't win this year. I'm Laura Marsh. And I'm Alex Perrine. This is The Politics of Everything. Today's episode is supported by Give Directly. How far do you think $1,000 can go? That's what Give Directly typically delivers to families living in extreme poverty to spend on what they need most. For Paul in Rwanda, it bought a cow, reinforced his thatched roof with metal, and launched his bicycle shop. For Eunice in Kenya, it covered food costs, paid her children's school fees, and sustained her tailoring business through COVID lockdowns. Visit givedirectly.org forward slash TNR to donate directly to people in need and read their stories about how far that money can go. That's givedirectly.org forward slash TNR. There's a certain kind of person who gets obsessed with the Nobel Prize. And Alex Shepard, a staff writer at the New Republic, who's been a guest on the show before, is one of them. Alex has a special ritual that he does every year as the date of the prize approaches. Alex, tell us about your process. What do you do to prepare for the Nobel? So every year, people bet on the Nobel Prize in Literature. And Ladbrokes, which is this kind of august British gambling institution, makes odds for who they think will win the prize. And I sort of handicap these odds. So I go through, there's usually about 50 names, although I add usually 20 or 25 names myself. Sometimes it's just people that I like. Sometimes it's people that I want to make fun of. And I kind of re-rank them based on if I think these people actually have a chance of winning the Nobel Prize. And historically speaking, I've been very, very bad at predicting the outcome. (laughs) So this is a list of writers from all over the world, some of the most famous writers in the world, some who you also may not have necessarily heard of if you're an English-speaking reader and you're trying to kind of categorize them according to how likely they are to be in with a chance of winning this prize. Yeah, so it's a mix of a lot of people that you've you're quite familiar with, or most people are probably quite familiar with, Haruki Murakami, uh, Joyce Carol Oates, uh, Michelle Wilbeck, Carl of Knausgaard, and then a sort of smattering of names that might be less familiar, particularly to American readers, people like Pierre Michon, Mircea Cartorescu, who's somebody who I think has just started appearing on these lists because I put him on my stupid list of predictions. (laughs) But one of the fun things about Nobel Prize speculating is that it is this kind of bizarre and slightly funhouse mirror-y survey of, of global literature. Right. You're kind of like taking the horse race approach and applying it straight to a list of living writers. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I like about it is that it's it's inherently pretty silly, right? These are extremely serious people and they're being treated with like almost complete disrespect in, in the process <laughs> of just like idiots like me. It's like throwing pennies at the Titanic or something. People just betting on whether or not they will win, you know, what has been the most prestigious and important global arts award since its inception. So how's your how's your record, Alex? You've been doing this for a few years. <laughs> well, it sort of depends on how you how you count. <laughs> I think I've gotten it sort of right twice. 
So I've listed <laughs> two of the people who won as favor as I thought of them as favorites to win. So there's Olga Tokarczuk, the Polish novelist of kind of a slightly magical realist fiction, and Svetlana Alexievich, the Belarusian oral historian. I got both of those. I'm sort of cheating here because I didn't say these two people are going to win. <laughs> I merely said I think that they could win. There were many other names in that bucket, right? I believe that there were at least six other names. I also usually have a list that's like 40 names at the end that's like who I think could win, and they're just kind of random people. None of those people have ever won, by the way. <laughs> so there are two uh, laureates who won that I didn't even list. And again, I usually list, I think, between 75 and 100 names. Those are <laughs> Kazuo Ishiguro, one of the most famous novelists on the planet, and Abul Razak Gurna, who is charitably not one of the most famous novelists on the planet, I think. No one had heard of him before he won last year. So Gurna, I can be forgiven for. Ishiguro is kind of a bad miss. <laughs> but he was nobody was betting on him, so I wasn't alone. And then the worst one was that for two years, 2015 and 2016, the first two years I did it, I explicitly said that Bob Dylan not only would not win the, the prize, but that I would eat my <laughs> vinyl record of Blood on the Tracks if he did win it. And he won in 2016. <laughs> Why do people care about the prize so much? Like you mentioned it's very prestigious. It's very august. It's just a prize and there are lots of other prizes. Why is this one so important? Well, it's sort of like the first prize. I mean, obviously, like people have been winning literary prizes forever. Like if you were living in Athens and... 2000 BC and you wrote a poem about Zeus being horny or something, you probably got like a laurel or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the modern prize doesn't really start until 1901 when Alfred Nobel uses his dynamite money to start the Nobel Prize in Literature. And I think this was part of this like sort of larger vogue at the time. It's like what eventually leads to the creation of the United Nations even of trying to find some sort of like global governance system. And for, for this prize, it was specifically the first prize to sort of look at the entire swath of global literature. And, and it kind of oddly presages a lot of domestic prizes. So like the Pulitzer Prize, for instance, it starts in America in 1918 as like a reaction to the Nobel Prize. The National Book Award starts as a reaction to the Pulitzer Prize, <laughs> failing to award William Faulkner before the Nobel, which is seen as this like great national embarrassment. So part of it is just the longer a prize has been given out, the more prestige accrues to it because you can point to it and say, well, this is the prize that W.B. Yeats has won and T.S. Eliot and William Faulkner and you can list all the stuff. But is there also a more immediate kind of like economic benefit attached to this prize? Like there's a lot of prize money, but also if you have a little display of your books at the front of Barnes & Noble and it says winner of whatever year Nobel Prize, like I would imagine that can have a real influence on sales. So yes and no. I mean, I think I haven't looked at Gurna's sales numbers, but you know, a lot of the recent laureates who aren't kind of bigger names have not mm -hmm. seen those kind of jumps. So there, you didn't really see this with Gurna. I mean, Gurna was not a name by Abel Razak. Gurna is most famous as a literary critic. Well, it was also hard for him to make that jump in sales, right? Because when he won the prize, almost none of his books were in print in the U.S. So you couldn't have that effect of. Someone sees the news, they hear about Abdul Razak Gurner, and they say, oh, this I could buy this for my daughter who likes reading, <laughs> which is sort of the, the sales mechanism that these prizes tend to generate. If your books just aren't out there, then you can't benefit from that effect. Yeah, I mean, I think what they do create, though, is this kind of canonization effect. So whether that happens with Gurna is sort of yet to be seen. There are other recent laureates like J.M.G. Leclesio or even Mo Yan, the Chinese satirical mm -hmm. novelist, who can maybe haven't made that jump. But Patrick Modiano, whose books were kind of circulating, but they weren't particularly well known, you know, he gets basically a big, you know, NYRB classics like retread. Now, he's not selling, <laughs> you know, 100,000 copies of any of these books or anything. But I think the the canonization effect is is pretty clear. Alice Munro is like, or even Mario Vargas Llosa are like great recent examples of authors who were already basically at this kind of summit. And again, here you too, you can also start to see how the Swedish Academy kind of works, right? Is that I think they do have a list of big names that they want to honor. And then they kind of mix it in and out with, with much smaller names. So we've had a kind of the last two Nobel laureates, Louise Glick and, and Abu Rasik Gurna are both, they're not huge names. So compared to somebody like Ishiguro. 
My brief kind of summary of the theory of the effects of the prize is if you're in the sweet, you're in the sweet spot of being like pretty well respected, a lot of your books are in print, it can just push you into a kind of canonical zone where you might start popping up more on kind of the to read lists of casual readers, right? If you're more obscure, you kind of maybe never make that jump. And then if you're super popular like Ishiguro, I would be curious if that's really had any effect on his sales. Like, how do you become more widely read than Kazuo Ishiguro was? Like, his books were already on sale in supermarkets in Europe. And then there's a kind of writer, like someone like Philip Roth, who also is in, was in, before he died, was in this category of like, you couldn't be more widely read as a living writer. And he really felt that he needed to have the Nobel Prize to kind of put the final stamp of genius on him. And it was like a yearly obsession that he would be like waiting for the phone call from Sweden and then like devastatingly crushed when the announcement came out every year and it wasn't him. And there was like a specific bench that he would sit on in Manhattan near his house and like sit there and like process his disappointment every year. So there is this kind of like weirdly like stratospherically famous writer who feels like they just need this. Like this is just the last thing to get that puts you up there with Eliot and Faulkner and all the geniuses. Yeah, I mean, Roth is sort of an interesting case, too, because I think that you also get the sense that, you know, a lot of literary legacies are but it's a fickle, you know, it's, they're fickle, right? So, you know, Roth, who is huge, you know, I think has also seen his reputation decline. And I feel like that, you know, if your uh, legacy is not so secure, it becomes much more important. And yet, you know, there's also, you can make this huge list of people who haven't won the prize, right? Mm. So James Joyce didn't win the prize. Proust didn't win the prize. Tolstoy didn't win the prize. Virginia Woolf didn't win it. Chekhov, Nabokov. Kafka, Rilke, Nabokov. Yeah, Brecht, Borges, Lorca, James Baldwin, right? Right. Like, there is a, an illustrious tradition of Nobel snubs. Yeah. And actually, this is something I wanted to ask you about. Like, when does it become a Nobel snub? Because, like, I'm not going to win the Nobel Prize. Alex isn't going to win the Nobel Prize. But we haven't been snubbed. You know, like, or there are, <laughs> or there are some very successful novelists out there. Like, you know, um, I'm just think. Rachel Cusk, right? She's not being snubbed every year if she doesn't win the Nobel Prize. So when does it? When do you enter like snub territory? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say probably if it's around. I mean, Roth is a sweet spot, right? You would have to be considered a, a canonical writer in your home country. You'd have to be internationally famous. I think I and many other people interpreted the Dylan Nobel Prize in part as a direct snub. On Roth. But. Explain the <laughs> dynamics there and the way you game it out. Because there are sort of like rules, unwritten rules that say like two Jewish men from America like are not going to win it two years in a row. Yeah, that's basically it. And I think also one of the reasons why I think Roth was so convinced that he was going to win is you look at this generation of post-war American writers that he's a part of. Pinch on Updike, I guess, too. And Roth is kind of at the top of that, at least if you're looking at who usually wins the Nobel Prize. He's speaking to, I think, a specific strain of American writing. He's internationally popular and famous and well regarded. And instead, the Academy was like, oh, we're going to award it to this <laughs> other guy. He's born around the same time. He's also. Jewish, and he is even more of a vo the voice of a generation than you. And I think, <laughs> and I think he's also probably somebody that Roth doesn't seem to have respected particularly much. And I think you know I should say too, like I I didn't think that Dylan was going to win it, but I'm like <laughs> he's the greatest. You know what I mean? Like, sure, you don't give a prize like that to someone who so evidently doesn't need it and whose fame so vastly supersedes the fame of the Nobel Prize. I mean. He is also working in a medium that is much more popular than the traditional like written literature. Yeah, I mean, a songwriter has never had never won it before, Bob Dylan, which is one of the reasons why I didn't think that it was going to happen. I think one of the things with the prize, there's a really good book called The Economy of Prestige that this guy, James English, uh, who's a professor at, I think, the University of Pennsylvania wrote, that basically makes the case that what a lot of these prizes are doing, and the Nobel, I think, is particularly deft at doing it, is like... You have to kind of be balancing things constantly. You have to give it to a popular writer or somebody who has an acclaim, and then you have to mix it in with all these kind of other people. And it can never be too obscure for too long, but you also can't have too many snubs. But the Roth thing, I think eventually it 
gets its own logic where at some point you're just like, well, of course, Philip Roth was never going to win the Nobel Prize. And I don't well, know why. There's a sense of like, if you want it too much, they're yes. not going to give it to you. If you start campaigning to get this prize, you've just forfeited your chances of getting it. After the break, we'll be back to talk about the campaign to award the Nobel to Salman Rushdie. What's the argument for giving it to him? And would it be in keeping with the prize of politics? We know the body can be a canvas for self-expression through clothing, jewelry, cosmetics, tattoos, and piercings. But new research shows the body may be a key to our self-consciousness. In his new book, Body Am I, scientist writer Moheb Kostandi examines how the brain perceives the body and how that influences our sense of self. Kostandi chronicles disorders and phenomena that illustrate when body and brain are out of sync, like phantom limbs, rubber hands, and anorexia, and explores vital questions about our relationships with our bodies, the nature of identity, and what it means to be human. If you enjoy nonfiction in psychology, philosophy, or health and wellness, don't miss Body Am I. Now available everywhere books are sold. Learn more at mitpress.mit.edu. No one will blame you for feeling like it's a pretty shaky time for America. On the new podcast, How to Save a Country, you'll meet the thinkers, doers, and organizers who are working to make the United States a more democratic and just place. People who are connecting the dots between economics, law, and politics. I'm Michael Tomaski of the New Republic. Join me and my co-host Felicia Wong of the Roosevelt Institute as we bring you the good news and the big ideas that point to a less fractured, more stable, more equal future. How to Save a Country. Listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. So uh, one of the reasons that we wanted to do the episode this year was because there's been this kind of campaign to get Salman Rushdie the Nobel Prize this year. And this isn't the first time that there's been a campaign for Rushdie to get the Nobel Prize. There was a kind of a movement for him to get this, or there was a lot of support for the idea of him getting it when he was first living under the fatwa, and he didn't get it. And actually, there was this whole controversy where one of the judges on the committee actually resigned because she was so appalled that they weren't giving it to Rushdie. And then that all kind of ebbed away. And then he emerged from hiding, started to live a more normal life. And then this summer, he was obviously the victim of an incredibly shocking, violent attack, has been recovering in hospital for the last couple of months. During that time, both Bernard-Henri Lévy and David Remnick have published pieces floating the idea that he should be awarded the Nobel Prize and that it would be a really strong statement of support for freedom of expression to give it to him. And so when I saw these, I felt like, oh, no, well, if he was ever going to win the Nobel Prize, like, it's definitely not going to happen now. <laughs> like, these, this, this is a prize where the committee really does not want to be seen to be pressured in any way. And I think it raises a question of what the prize is. There's sort of a feeling that it is a political decision who you give it to, but it's not an incredibly clear cut political decision. Like they're not going to make the obvious move. Can you talk us through the sort of like the recent politics that you can intuit from some of the prizes? What do we broadly expect them to reward? And how have they seemed to sort of deviate from that or duck and dive? Yeah, so there are two, I think, contextual things that are kind of worth drilling down on a little bit here. One is that, you know, the prize is still governed by a couple of kind of arcane sets of rules. So the prize is administered by the Swedish Academy, which I, I believe was formed in 1786. They serve lifetime terms. They have their own internal guidelines. And those guidelines for the prize were created as part of this bequest by Alfred Nobel. And part of that bequest also insists that the works should be written for the greatest benefit of mankind and, quote, in an idealistic direction. It's quite a broad remit. Yes, and the Academy <laughs> has followed this, I think, quite famously in the 1920s. It followed it a little more closely, kind of awarding these kind of epic novels of bootstrapping or whatever people were writing about back then. And, you know, it ignores it when it feels like it. But one of the other things that's happened is the prize was canceled in 2018 as part of this like pretty massive Me Too scandal. 
in which basically the husband of one of the people on the academy was accused by 18 women of sexual assault. There was this wave of resignations, but there was also a power struggle within the academy. So you saw this kind of new direction of the prize, the awarding of really Alexievich, Dylan, and Ishiguru all being part of a kind of slightly more expansive interpretation of, mm-hmm. of literature itself. And I think what happened within the academy, based on reporting and some conversations with people that I talked to in Sweden, is that there was a kind of conservative backlash within the academy, and the prize has since reformed in a more <laughs> slightly more conservative direction. So when they came back in 2019, they awarded two prizes. One was to, to Peter Hanka, who was mm-hmm. a very controversial figure. That could be interpreted in some ways as a political statement, but what you never see is an explicit reaction in the way that Henri Levy and, and Remnick are, are asking for. You, right. It just hasn't happened ever. Well, so something I wanted to run by you is a kind of theory of why people expect the Nobel Prize to make that kind of point, which is that I think there was a period during the Cold War, when the Nobel Prize, well, they were pretty consistently giving out prizes to dissident writers, to people who had defected from the USSR and come to live in the West. And then it wasn't always that every year, but there was a high ratio of those kinds of writers winning it. I think people came to see the Nobel Prize as being a kind of reward for writers who took extraordinary risks to be able to publish their work or who had made a real statement or stood up for freedom of expression and the kind of Western conception of that in this big struggle of ideas of the West versus the Soviet Union. Once you have the end of the Cold War, the prize sort of like loses that rationale, but it's still awarding to writers who broadly embody those values of freedom of expression. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest reason why people have held on to that is, as you said, that there was this record, but also it's one of the only things that you can hold on to with the prize itself is that there is this kind of consistent awarding of yeah books by authors who had stood up for freedom of expression in some way or had been in sort of war-torn situations or places where they had been persecuted in some ways for their mm-hmm. writing. And the expectation was that this would continue. For instance, you know, there's like a Dunis, who's a Syrian poet, has been like mm-hmm. a front runner, you know, particularly in the early 2010s, was always the sort of front runner for the prize in terms of the betting. I think a lot of it is just that we don't really know what these people talk about, right? The list of finalists isn't publicized until 50 yeah. years afterwards. It's not like the Booker Prize where we get the long list and we get the short list and then we get the winner. Yeah, you, we simply have no idea what is happening at any point. So what would be the argument for Rushdie to get that prize? Well, I think what you see in the Henri Levy and Remnick pieces is this argument that the prize should stand up to this assault on free speech. And I think that that's an argument that you know is rooted in, in these debates about cancel culture, particularly in America, but I think also in Europe as well. And there's a kind of implicit argument that whatever college students are doing at Oberlin right now is somehow the same or quite similar to this guy who stabbed Salman Rushdie a bunch of times in Chautauqua. And I think that that is tasteless. It's also not how the Academy works, but I think it also ignores the recent history of the prize itself, which is that they did sort of give a prize on behalf of freedom of expression when they awarded Peter Mm Honka. They said that essentially Honka's political views, which are, in my opinion, abhorrent, they just kind of hand waved the whole thing. I mean, I have talked to members of the Swedish Academy and they just said, you know, we don't care about that. All we care about is, is the sort of novels themselves. I'm only being a little facetious when I say that that was a prize that fought back against cancel culture. And I think it should be seen in that way. And I think the fact that, that that's sort of ignored in those pieces is revealing. Well, the, the statement they're making there is that they will express whatever they want to express as a committee, right? That nothing will stop them giving the prize to who they want to give it to, which in this case is Peter Hanke. Yes. And not so much rewarding his free expression or Salman Rushdie's free expression. But it's also, it's not the Nobel Prize for bravest speech. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what seems to be the flaw in the argument there. I mean, they're, they're not really making a case for Rushdie on literary merit so much. Yeah, I mean, there is a case to be made there. I think it's probably a little narrower than the prize is usually awarded for. It would be built on the back of essentially three novels. Rushdie's, you know, post-fatwa output has been pretty terrible for the most part. And I think that that's why you see this kind of confusing effort to turn this into the kind of pen America 
you know, mm-hmm. award for freedom of mm-hmm. expression, as opposed to, as Laura said, I think this this award that is very self consciously and at times, I think at times in a kind of convoluted way, is trying to only make this case that it, you know, it's immune to these kind of outside debates. I mean, one Swedish person I should say, fairly connected within the arts and culture scene there, you know, explicitly said that it would be tasteless if they gave it to Rushdie, and I think that that's how members of the committee would feel as well. Right, it's more plausible to imagine them doing it in 10 years' time or 10 years ago than now. Yeah, I mean, the time to give him the award for freedom of expression was in 1990. You got into this a little bit with talking about the scandal, but, you know, like, quite literally, who elected these guys? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Alfred Alfred Nobel, I guess. But, like, what are their qualifications? Who are these people? They tend to be sort of people in Sweden who are connected in the the publishing industry in some way, they tend to be either poets or writers or scholars. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the process is extremely secretive. And again, you serve you serve a lifetime, you know, appointment. It's basically like being a Supreme Court justice, but for literature, right? Yes. And basically, <laughs> like yeah. Once you're on the bench, <laughs> that you, only you get to decide if you leave. Yeah, I mean, they resign all the time because they bicker with each other. But they and again, can't I mean, be impeached, right? They can't no be one. impeached. I mean, I feel like it should be more like the monarchy in that it has this kind of <laughs> mystical air because it's completely opaque and no one understands it and it's probably irrational and none of the people giving out the award really deserve to be there. And that, that just adds to the mystique and the prestige of the prize. To me, it's more like the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Yes. Like, why are these Why are these people here? Why are they in charge? <laughs> I just find it to be very baffling that we've all collectively agreed they're the ones who get to decide what the best writer is. Yeah, I mean, it also creates this other kind of weird stuff where, you know, like, you know, I, I always talk to a bunch of sort of somewhat in the know Swedish people around this time of year. I mean, no one on the <laughs> Academy itself, but, you know, you just get these kind of weird things where, where you know, somebody just DM'd me and was like... You know that one of the guys on the committee this year really loves Knausgard, you know. I'm like, <laughs> could it be could it be the Knausgard year? What are his odds this year? I think he was twenty to one the last time I checked. Well, I saw that Stephen King has odds on the <laughs> yeah. Mad Brooks thing, which was baffling. I mean, yeah. what do you think's going on there? My assumption is that somebody just bet big on Stephen King. And again, you also think about this from Ladbrokes' perspective. Like, they want people to bet on... They want people to bet on it, right? It's yeah. the same. Well, it's funny because it's, mm. it's like all gambling. The <laughs> odds are set as much by what you want the punters to do as by what you expect the Academy to do. Exactly. And so I think, like, Murakami has become the new Bob Dylan for me. And that he's, you know, almost always listed as a favorite. I think he's at 16 to 1 this year. I am as convinced that he would not win as I was convinced that Bob Dylan would not win. So take this as a grain of salt. But there's this kind of push pull here where Murakami's status is the most, you know, popular writer of literary fiction that makes him this sort of leading candidate for the prize. But it is the fact that he is the most popular writer of literary fiction in the world that is like almost certainly why he won't win the prize. So this year, who's making it into the likely to win category? I will say three three names. One is Jan Fossey, a Norwegian playwright. He would be the first dramatist to win, I think, since... Since Pinter, maybe. Since Pinter, yeah. He also is a, a novelist, incredible novelist. He's extremely Scandinavian. He literally has a book called <laughs> Melancholy. There is a lot of noise about a Chinese writer winning. Chu, who is this kind of amazing, uncategorizable, kind of avant-garde Chinese writer, I think would probably be my pick. And then she'll be in New York in a couple of weeks. Annie or No, the Mm -hmm. um, French memoirist, is I think one of, I mean, I would love it if she won. She's amazing. She wrote this book, The Years, which is this kind of memoir that's written in the third person. Simple Passion. If she won the Nobel Prize, I think that's a novella that everyone would read in future years. Yes. I mean, that is the the best, single best affair book ever written, Simple Passion. I was going to ask you about her earlier, actually, because I think if they gave it to her, that would also read as a different kind of political statement. Because happening, her novel about getting an abortion before it was legal, that could be seen as a statement about Roe v. Wade being overturned and abortion access being restricted. Obviously, that's a pretty local concern to the U.S., but I do think that's something that the world is like looking at and that the committee could plausibly choose to comment on obliquely if they decided to award it to her, even though she's a French writer. 
I think it would probably be similar to Dylan winning it in 2016 and that um, the committee would have plausible deniability about it being a political mm-hmm. statement. But I think certainly in the U.S. there would be plenty of people who would read it that way. Okay, so the most important question, who is definitely not going to win the Nobel Prize? Because this is the prediction you're usually wrong about, so we think we need this on tape. Haruki Murakami not going to win. Salman Rushdie not going to win. Stephen King not going to win. Joyce Carol <laughs> Oates not going to win. <laughs> I can keep going. I, I would normally say Knausgaard, but I'm, now I'm a little... I'm a little shook. <laughs> the other name that keeps coming up in my conversations with Swedes is um, Michel Welbeck, the <laughs> controversial <laughs> French novelist. Mm-hmm. I don't think the Academy has the stomach to do that so soon after Ahanka, but you never know. I'll say Welbeck, not going to win. But he's right. the first name that's come up with in conversations with at least three Swedish people. Jonathan Franzen, also not going to win. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> that's where we had to end this. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. The Politics of Everything is co-produced by TalkHouse. Emily Cook is our executive producer. Myron Kaplan is our audio editor. If you enjoy The Politics of Everything and you want to support us, one thing you can do is go to wherever you listen to the podcast and rate the show. Every rating and review helps. Thanks for listening. Would you like to hear more from TNR? Every day, our writers and editors work to bring you the reporting and analysis you need to make sense of the world but we can't do it without you. Please consider subscribing to The New Republic with our special offer at tnr.com slash special offer. That's tnr.com slash special offer.